I think this is I think this is appropriately silly. Grandpa would appreciate it. I want to know why you don't have to wear black. I'm not a black person. I am Let's go. Yeah. Maybe less for less. Just gonna sit here and keep you company. <laughs> Jerry and Debbie are here with Nomi. And Lisa's here. And the rest of the guys. <laughs> ben and Dave are on their way back from the airport with us. That's what I heard.
waiting on a couple of people. heard from them if he knows where they are. How you guys doing? What can be said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 
speak English now. just said four and seven times a day there. I didn't even start out to write in the book at all, but I just magically got it. Yours truly. He had a big breakfast, like you have had. Some of his leftovers in the fridge from his miracle waffle. <coughs> with vegan butter and noodle oil for breakfast. Or pulp too. Crack a battle. Finest breakfast in town. Okay, I can be right back. Whatever I want to be right now. Good news, Elder has left. Elder has Rabbi Rooney returned to Canada. So everybody needs to be on the same page right now. who created me. He graduated from high school with a concentration in handball, majored in clean up all at college, and held honorary doctorates in softball and physics. So, as I can see it. I just talked up there, we're 14 minutes in.
to our family gathered here and to those that are joining us online. We come together today to pay tribute to Ira Brynus, to remember him, to recall his life, and to say goodbye. Adonai ma'adam v'te da'ehu ben enosh v'techashavehu. Adam lehevel dama yamav kitzel over baboker yatzitz v'chalaf la'erev yumalel v'yavesh. O God, what are we that you have regard for us? What are we that you are mindful of us? It seems like we are little more than a breath, our days like a passing shadow. We come and go like grass. In the morning it shoots up renewed, and yet in the evening it fades and withers. You cause us to return to dust, saying, Return, O you mortal creatures. If only we were wise and understood where we are going. But this we do know. Mark the wholehearted. Behold the upright. They shall know true peace. We turn to the Psalms, these beautiful poems, with the hope that we might garner some measure of consolation, that their words might comfort us. And I share this. The days of our years are threescore and ten, or perhaps by reason of strength, fourscore years. But a thousand years in God's sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And here's the essential message of the psalm. Teach us, therefore, to number our days that we may attain a heart of wisdom. May your favor, O God, be upon us. Establish the work of our hands that it may long endure. I'd like to call upon Rabbi Arne Slutelberg. Epitaph. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and people who wait to die. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give me. I want to leave you something something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've known or loved. And if you cannot give me away, at least let me live on in your eyes and not in your mind. You can love me most by letting go of children who need to be free. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. I'd like to invite granddaughter Talia to share loving thoughts of her grandfather. In his last days, Grandpa told me that his death was no cause for sadness, but rather a celebration. 
he knew what a profound legacy he was leaving and what a tremendous family he created with Grandma. My husband Andy expressed a similar sentiment, telling Grandpa, you made one hell of a family. Not everybody is lucky enough to have two grandparents, to have any grandparents well into adulthood, but I was very blessed with two. I am so proud of my grandparents' lives. They came from Jewish immigrant families in Brooklyn, Grandpa from Bensonhurst and Grandma from Borough Park. They acquired education and business success, moving their then family of four to Long Island and then their family of five to a farm in Hunterdon County, New Jersey. Their farm was the home base and center of their ever-growing family for decades until four years ago when they moved to Cleveland. I was living at my parents' home next door to Grandma and Grandpa's new home when they moved here. And oh, how fortunate I have been to have them so close by. <laughs> Grandpa made Grandma and me dinner on many nights. We ate grilled lamb chops, pan-seared steak, breaded cod, a chopped salad with heavy, fresh-squeezed lemon juice almost always, and often a pile of sautéed onions. He loved making cream spinach, and because I don't eat dairy, he would pull out some spinach for me before he added the cream. When he made us chicken parmesan, he would use gluten-free panko and leave the fresh mozzarella off some of the pieces for me. And even though keeping track of the ever-changing roster of dietary preferences and allergies was nearly impossible, he always made sure we all had something to eat. When a Luna Bakery and Cafe opened nearby, Grandma and Grandpa began hosting Sunday morning brunch there every single week. The 8.30 a.m. start time was a compromise. He would have had us there even earlier. To Grandpa, food was connection and family. We knew that if we went to Grandpa's, he would make sure we ate. Whenever I walked over to their house after getting home from law school classes, he would give me a rundown of what was in the fridge. When his grandchildren stayed late on a Sunday, he would ask us what we wanted to eat for dinner. He always invited us to sit down and help yourself to a beer. Just last week, I went over there at the end of Yom Kippur and we drank gin and tonics together. He began to enjoy cocktails in recent years. When he agreed to stop going to the grocery store at the start of COVID, I began ordering his groceries for him on Instacart. It became our weekly ritual. After the circular came out, Grandpa would call me with his order. I began reading the circular too. He enjoyed shopping and I enjoyed hearing his food plans for the week. He would order, for instance, bok choy, and I would ask him, what are you going to do with that? Add it to my chicken soup, he would answer. He loved tomatoes, organic baby spinach, mushrooms, a watermelon quarter, and Pete and Jerry's eggs. He ordered so much produce and it inspired me to eat more fruits and vegetables too. Once the food was delivered, I would call him to confirm that it had arrived. If there were any errors, he would certainly let me know. This past week was the first time I read the circular knowing he wasn't reading it too, and it was the first time in over a year that he didn't place an order with me. I'm going to miss this ritual so much. I knew how lucky I was that my grandpa, a man of few words, wanted to call me every week. And I'm just heartbroken that I'll never get to do that again with him. Andy and I used to half joke that Grandpa and Grandma were our best couple's friends. And this was really only a half joke because they truly were the couple we hung out with the most. Weeknight dinners, their first 4th of July in Cleveland, three-day weekend barbecues. We were four people, and he would make meat to feed at least ten. The New Year's Eve after Andy and I became engaged, one year before our wedding, Grandpa wanted to take the four of us to the nicest seafood restaurant in town. We made reservations and discussed logistics, what to wear, and perhaps what to order. 
When New Year's Eve actually arrived, Grandpa and Grandma were under the weather. Instead, we bought the ingredients for a similar feast, prepared it at Grandpa and Grandma's house, and then settled in with our meal and drinks. After dinner, we watched a show about years past Hollywood stars, Fred Astaire, Judy Garland, Frank Sinatra, and the like. Grandpa and Grandma offered their own commentary. I knew then how precious those nights were. And then another whole year rolled by, and they were celebrating Andy and my wedding on New Year's Eve 2019. How lucky we all were to be together for such a joyful occasion. Grandpa looked incredibly dapper in his suit and tie that matched the groom, groomsmen, and fathers. And Grandma was radiant, too. We really were just so lucky to have them in our midst. And it is really hard to believe that they will never be here again. Grandpa's heart broke when Grandma died. And we rallied around him with a renewed commitment to spending evenings and weekends with him. We began a weekly Sunday Zoom call for him to see his children and grandchildren. Grandpa was tech savvy, using his iPhone to Zoom, FaceTime, use Amazon, and order lifts. He loved animals, showering his last Belgian sheepdog, Parlay, with ear rubs, scrambled eggs for breakfast, and his leftover salmon and tuna sashimi, which she wasn't quite sure what to do with initially. He purchased, a, he purchased a scooter and would take it for spins, as he called them, around the cul-de-sac, making dear friends in his final years. He was kind and so unbelievably generous. He loved a good back massage, and I was happy to oblige him. Growing up, his entire family would congregate at his home, and he would make enormous steaks and mashed potatoes for dinner, and lox eggs and onions for breakfast. For our birthdays, including my July 2nd one, he would order he would order a large strawberry cassata cake. To be honest, as a child, I didn't really appreciate fruit in my birthday cake. <laughs> now, I can think of nothing more decadent than vanilla sponge cake, whole strawberries, and freshly whipped cream. Estelle Nora, our daughter, was born this past June. Just weeks before her birth, I overheard Grandpa saying that he was waiting for me to produce the queen. The joy in his face, the laughter in his voice, and the twinkle in his eye at seeing Stella was undeniable. At his last family dinner one week ago, he marveled at Stella balancing and pressing her little feet on his hand. How lucky we all were to have great grandpa Ira in our midst. I didn't want to lose grandpa and I made him promise me that he would keep eating. And he ate well all the way to the end. An open faced smoked salmon bagel with scallion cream cheese and chalva for break the fast. Lemon chicken, raisin challah to soak up the ajou and a rich chocolate cake with chocolate ganache for his last dessert. And fresh squeezed, always fresh squeezed, and only fresh squeezed <laughs> orange juice at the very end. I will miss you so, Grandpa. Long live, Grandpa. Endless stories, lifetimes and lifetimes of stories. We are all so blessed to have these stories of Grandpa.
Here's what he said to a few of us just days before he died, less than a week. I've had a fantastic life. There is nothing to mourn here. Don't weep for me. Well, he gave us our marching orders. We're not going to follow them entirely because we will weep and cry. And we will mourn. But as we mourn, we will also appreciate his life and the gift that he was. And our mourning will be mixed with gratitude and with love. Let's start at the beginning. His laugh was legendary. I can't imitate it. No one can. Even those who try don't quite get it right. It was unique and truly his. And though we can't replicate it exactly, every one of us hears it in our mind's ear. We all hear it. It's a laugh that's going to echo through the generations. Let's speak about the generations. Ira and Estelle were the parents of Roxanne and Eric and Jacqueline. They were the grandparents of nine wonderful and unique individuals. This order is by parentage, not in age order. But of course, Roxanne and I brought them Talia and Eli and Micah. And in turn, they brought us Andrew and Holly and Hannah. Rick and Debbie brought into the world Alexandra and David and Benjamin, and of course Jacqueline and Shimon brought Shay and Michael Sanford, Sandy, and David. And Tali has mentioned how fortunate just in these past few months that she and Andy brought us Estelle Nora, named of course for Grandma Estelle. It's impossible to talk about mom, to talk about dad without talking about mom. They met at a friend's birthday party. I think it was a friend of a friend, actually. Ira was 17. Estelle was 14. He had been invited to the party by his good friend, Lenny Schneider. Dad didn't want to go at first because he said, that the next morning he had a softball game and he had to be there early. He was going to skip the party, but Lenny talked him out of it, thank goodness. Told him, just come. And Lenny, of course, would become Uncle Lenny to Iris' children and to all of us. And they married when Ira was 23 and Estelle was 20. I mentioned... Uncle Lenny, but that would only be telling part of the story if I didn't also recognize Dad's oldest friend, Bob Wellman, or Uncle Bob. And the three couples, Bob and Joan, Lenny and Gerda, Ira and Estelle, they were the strongest of friends, amazing friendships. Three couples who were devoted to each other and loyal in every circumstance they went through in life. They reveled in each other's successes and they supported each other through hard times, and there were both. Friends like that are a true gift. From when they started dating until mom's death 18 months ago, they were a couple for 70 years, married for just one month shy of 64 of those years. I said it at mom's funeral, and it's true today. Theirs was a love affair for the ages. Shortly after they met at that party in November, Ira couldn't believe that Estelle didn't have a date already for New Year's Eve. 
so he boldly asked her out. It would be the first of many New Year's Eves together. And their last New Year's Eve together, New Year's Eve, was in 2019, when they and all of us spent the weekend celebrating the wedding of their granddaughter Talia to her beloved Andy. Mom and dad were in all their glory that night, surrounded by their children, their nine grandchildren, celebrating that wonderful simcha. Both of them were beaming so. And despite dad's walker and mom's cancer, they danced and they celebrated. And what a privilege it was to honor them that evening as the creators of this grand family. It was a night to remember. After they married in May of 1956, they followed a fairly typical Jewish migratory pattern from Brooklyn to Long Island to New Jersey. But, was, but what was extraordinarily atypical was when these two Brooklyn-bred and born Jews bought and moved to a small farm in West Central New Jersey in 1973. That farm on Hibbler Road, it became a magical destination for their grandchildren, for all the family, for everyone who knew them. Ira grew his own steer. And if you were a meat eater, his was the best meat you ever tasted. That's just the fact. And he knew how to cook it. Rarest of rare for himself. He would introduce the flame to the meat. That was enough. And a little bit more cooked for everyone else. He made an exception for me and let me ruin the meat by cooking it well done. And when a steer was taken from the pasture and returned by the butcher, all wrapped up in white freezer paper and properly labeled, Ira would take any remaining meat that was in the freezer from last year's steer and donate it to the local food bank in Hunterdon County. Every year he gave hundreds of pounds of meat to the hungry and to those in need. It was a giant mitzvah that he performed in his own quiet and gracious way. He neither asked for nor wanted any recognition for this. He did it because it made him feel good to help others, especially if that meant feeding them. And feed them he did. Estelle and I were bred and raised Belgian sheepdogs for more than half a century. They got their first dog before they had children. They became among the country's leading breeders, and they produced champions and show winners. And all through those years, he was an active member of the Belgian Sheepdog Club of America, BSCA, ultimately serving as its president in the 1980s, 1983, I think it was. He was also qualified to serve as an AKC judge for the breed. Ira was so proud of Estelle. He delighted in her success. He loved that she earned a Ph.D. at age 50. He bragged on her about how she was light years ahead of her time in the field of occupational therapy. David remembers how at her 80th birthday, Grandpa gave a toast, calling her remarkable. And everyone knew that her success was not hers alone. Ira was with her every step of the way. His insight and support helped build her OT consultancy and then paved the path for her academic career as a professor of OT. They loved each other dearly and deeply. And Dad quietly grieved her since her death. He missed her every day. Dad has one sister, Lenore, and he loves her so. Theirs was a special 
relationship, a true bond. And he always had a smile when he would talk about her or when he would share the news from their latest conversation. And he adored her children, his niece, Sherry, and his nephew, Jordan, Zichrono Livercha, who died just weeks ago. He consoled his sister, even as he understood that his own time was limited. Lenore, we weep with you today. All of us know what you and dad meant to each other, and we know how much you will miss him. Yesterday, we gathered as a family and we shared many, many stories. I took a few notes, and when I read through them last evening and last night, I found three common threads amongst all the stories that we tell. Number one, food, food, food. Tali already talked about this. He loved food. He lived for food. His obituary references this. Quote, he loved growing, raising, cooking, sharing, and eating it. Food, food, food. Number two, bigger is better, more is better. If you need one of something, buy ten. In short, and I forget who said this, there is no such thing as too big or too many. And three, though dad wasn't the most religious man, inefficiency was an unforgivable cardinal sin in the Ira Brinus Bible. He loved sports, hours and hours, playing sports, watching sports. He was a shortstop who knew how to hit. He played in local men's leagues well into his 40s. And Micah remembers going to Indian games with, Indians games with Grandpa, sometimes Grandma too. And before the old Yankee Stadium was torn down, he and Grandpa went to a game there. And after the new one was built, they went to a game at that new stadium. And all of us remember the outlandish July 4th barbecues. There were never invitations issued to anyone because everyone was welcome and everybody knew it. And if you came even once, it was a permanent standing invitation. The food was plentiful, the beer was cold, the hamburgers were rare, and the watermelon was in the pool as a play toy for the children and the grandchildren. The professional grade train set was set up and ready to run. All you had to do was ask. For years, Mom and Dad, along with Connie and Dwayne, who were friends and neighbors, but really our family. The four of them would take all the children and grandchildren out for a fancy New Year's Eve dinner at a variety of fine and fancy restaurants. We would all dress up, including Alex and Talia, in their grandmother's furs. And I think I have this right, that it was on those occasions that many of the grandchildren had their first taste of creme brulee. Dad had a curious love of machinery and tools that he wasn't equipped to operate properly or safely. All I have to do is say the word power washer, and I know immediately what you're all thinking. I honestly don't have time here today to review the stories of the camping trips and the dog shows, the salad made in garbage bags, the Irish coffee, or Harvey's absolutely first-class Bloody Marys. We'll save those stories for back at the house. He was so incredibly proud of each of his nine grandchildren. He genuinely admired your intelligence and creativity, your beauty, your ingenuity, your talents, and your resourcefulness. Once we started having children and creating a new generation for the family, 
dad put in an order letting us know that he wanted nine grandchildren so that he could field a baseball team. And Roxanne and Rick and Jackie came through for him, providing him with the nine he requested, and importantly, providing several lefties so we had a deep pitching staff. Three of the grandchildren are married, and Dad so wonderfully welcomed Holly and Hannah and Andy. They instantly became his grandchildren. He opened his heart to them, and you felt the love that came from Grandpa. How happy he was to celebrate their weddings. Mom and Dad always talked about dancing at the grandchildren's weddings. And for Hannah and Micah's wedding, he and Mom found out that they really did enjoy flying first class. <laughs> Alex, and David, and Ben remember Grandpa and Grandma coming to sporting events and competitions. They cheered them on endlessly. And sometimes if the game was short an umpire, Grandpa stood in. And Dave, yesterday you remember being a little boy and racing Grandpa down the hallway of a hotel somewhere. You say Grandpa won the race. Alex, years ago, nicknamed Grandma Graham Cracker, and Eli named, nicknamed Grandpa Grizzly, which eventually was shortened to Grizz some of the time. And oh, how they loved these names. They carried them like honorific titles. And both of them used to say, more than all of the fancy letters after Grandma's name, the most important title that she had and that he had were Grandma and Grandpa. Jackie and Rick and Roxanne, you remember your family dinner table and the It's Academic family quiz show that Ira conducted whenever he saw fit. He would ask you trick questions, present riddles, challenge you with puzzles that made you think and figure and find interesting so solutions to seemingly unsolvable problems. And cleverly and knowingly, he taught you mental agility and creative thinking and problem solving skills that you used, not just as children at the dinner table, but throughout your lives, professionally and personally. He was an unbelievably supportive father, encouraging each of you in your pursuits. Roxanne would be the first to tell you that she was able to become a physician because she knew that dad believed in her and she had his backing every step of the way. Early in her life, dad gave her a poster borrowing from Teddy Roosevelt's quotation about the doer of deeds and the critic. He gave this to her to encourage her to try to strive for the best, to risk failure in pursuit of a higher goal. It's been a guiding light for her, her entire life. Dad was charming and photogenic. He was one of those people about whom it can truly be said that he never took a bad picture. He was smart and quick especially with numbers and dates. He made friends easily and quickly, right up to the very end of his life, becoming the honorary mayor of our lane when he moved next door to us and began to meet all of our neighbors. He loved them and they loved him. And he championed women, especially smart women. Dad started out as a reluctant traveler. I told the story yesterday. He didn't want to get a passport. But with a little encouragement from mom, we'll never know exactly what she said. 
over the years, he did get his passport, and they began to travel. And they began to travel, and they didn't stop. Europe, Scandinavia, Israel, the Middle East, Puerto Rico, Australia twice. And he would get a giant grin on his face and tell you that he loved New Zealand the most of anywhere that he ever traveled. Let it be remembered on this day that Ira always had a lot of special requests when he ordered at a restaurant. He knew good food, and he always had a request that would make it better and more to his liking. Tell the chef to use whole garlic. Add a little spinach to that. Soft scramble those eggs on a low heat. Fold them gently and not too much. Bring a slice of, bring a side of sliced tomatoes and onions, please. The list was long. And concomitant with this, he was a good tipper. Ira established and maintained long friendships, too many to mention. I've already mentioned a few. I can't single all of you out and everyone online because unquestionably I will inadvertently forget to mention some of your names. But you know who you are. He had long and deep friendships with people. About his friends at the Italian bakery in Flemington, where he was an honorary member of the Italian American Club, Ira's grandson, David, said yesterday, I think that was his place of worship. <laughs> Just hours before he died, Tammy came from Oregon to visit him. To all of his friends, Ira loved you, and you know that. And you helped make his life so rich and so wonderful. After years of nudging, we finally got mom and dad to move to Cleveland when the house next door to us in Pepper Pike became available. These past few years have been so wonderful having them next door. They loved being here, and we loved having them next to us. Roxanne, words cannot describe the gift that you gave your parents as you took care of them. You made sure that in their final years, they were never alone. And instead, you made sure that they were surrounded by family and friends and people who loved them. Your drives out to Sulphur Springs with Dad to share a breakfast and to look at the water and the trees, he so cherished that time with you. I had the opportunity last night to look at some of the Facebook posts that people have shared, words of condolence, words of remembrance. Our friend Rabbi Steve Engel wrote this on Facebook. So sorry to hear, loved him. He was an amazing man of kindness, compassion, and determination. A teddy bear with wisdom and a sharp sense of humor. Family was everything to him, and it showed. He left his mark and will be missed by many, including me. Here's the core of who Ira was. He was such a decent and moral human being with a clear sense of right and wrong. He was authentic, genuine, and real. He accepted others, believing and stating most recently, anyone can believe whatever they want. He could have cared less what creed you lived by, as long as you were honest and true and upstanding. And like a good son, he loved his mother's cooking. Here's what our neighbor and friend Jerry Isaac Shapiro wrote on Facebook last night. It was our good fortune to know him, and his wit and humor and generosity maintained our sanity during the pandemic. 
a gracious personality, and a giving heart. His name is and will be a blessing. Indeed, it will be. I can't say it better than Dad did. I've had a fantastic life. His words. Zecher tzadik livracha. The memory of this good and righteous man. This loving husband and father, son and brother, grandfather and great-grandfather, uncle and friend to so many. His memory will, for be a bl- uh, for, will be forever a blessing to all of us who knew him and who loved him. Amen. Birth is a beginning and death a destination. But life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion, and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness, from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, from grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey stage by stage, a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing, a sacred pilgrimage. We shall forever Remember Ira's voice, his laugh, his smile, his eyes, his hug, his beautiful, grisly face, his love, his compassion, his support. Let us pause for a moment of silence as each of us remembers Ira in our own way, followed by the mourner's prayer chanted by Jackie. Please rise. Same Nuchan Nuchonat ha 
Nachat kann verschrina. Malot kedoshim motorim. Kizohar harakia mazhirim. Et nishma. Israel Shlomo Ben Aharon Vitabarifka Shehalach Leholamo Begun Eden to him in Nuhato. Ana, Ana bar harachamim has direhu besiter kenafa, kenafecha leolamim. Utzor bitzor achaim et nishmato Adonai unachalato Vianuach b'shalom al mishkavo Venomar Passionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your shelter and presence to Yisrael Shlomo ben Aharon the Dabba Rivka, to Ira Stewart Brynus, for he has now entered eternity. O God of mercy, we pray, may Ira find refuge in your eternal presence. And may his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. And we all say, Amen. Please be seated. We will continue our service at Mount Olive Cemetery following the burial visitation with the family will be at Ira's residence 30949 Summit Lane in Pepper Pike. Visitation will be outside in lieu of COVID. Masks and vaccinations will be required. And we will gather and welcome people today from 2 to 5 p.m. The tomorrow evening, if the weather is good, and then again on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. To all of us, Iris family, to all who have joined us online, we conclude our service here with these traditional words of consolation. <laughs> May God comfort us along with all those who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem and our community. Amen.
Chapel to the right, the fire's are there. The bonuses, cemetery, put out your headlights. 